Are you ready to learn? Because my super experienced guests are ready to share some really valuable information. Make sure and listen all the way to the end to get help and support. So let's start with the best audio experience. $20 million, 14 companies because of content marketing. I know it's very important today to consider this type of marketing. And I remember when Sam Godin said that content marketing is only one marketing left. So because today customers are so clever, they're smart. You can't cheat them. You can't get results without sharing value first. That's why content marketing is so important. And I'm so excited to discuss this topic with Trevor Longino. How are you? I am well, thank you. How are you, Natalie? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. Uh, Monday, I love this day. Uh, I love learning about content marketing because I always use this channel for my clients, for my own projects. Because I think today most customers check out your profile, check out what kind of information you have because everyone want to get value first. So if you provide value first, then they will buy your products. Before we start, just tell more about your self-experience, background, about your footing companies, about your revenue that you uh, earn with these companies and anything about your background. Sure, I'll give you the the real quick pitch. I've taken 14 different companies from zero to two million and more in annual revenue, some up to 10, 15 million. Uh, I've been a startup marketer for 20 years. I uh, pretty much only build launch startups. Uh, and I'm now CEO of Crowd Tamers, which is a marketing agency that works with early stage startups, uh, startups, early stage startups to help them get their marketing solved and figure out the right way to go to market fast and so that's done through combination of content marketing and performance marketing mm -hmm. yeah C can you tell how to fight uh the right format uh for example okay if i have a project and i need to uh, launch uh content marketing campaigns but content marketing is huge seo social media name them many different channels so how to find the right channel so there are two or three ways to tackle finding the right channel to get your message out with. One of them is what I like to do at the beginning of a content marketing push is I actually like to use performance marketing to find my audience because the power in content marketing is as you do more and more of it over time, all these small wins pile up to make you more findable in SEO, more aligned with your brand messaging, all of those things later but if you start and you don't know the target you should be aiming for it's easy to build a content marketing funnel for somebody who's not actually your buyer and so what i like to do to start is to come up with several different pieces of content and distribute them either through paid distribution on facebook ads or on reddit ads or through just social media distribution where you go post repeatedly in different channels your content to a given audience and what you're looking to do is see what's getting comments on the actual platform you're running on. So if you're making YouTube videos, what type of content do you make that gets comments, that gets likes, that gets shares? You're also looking for what drives traffic back to your website from a Reddit post or from a tweet or from a LinkedIn post or wherever it is. You're looking for the numbers that show your content is successful because this is a really big deal for most content writers, most content marketers they think i published three blog posts this week i did my work right and the answer of course is no that's maybe 20 percent of the work 80 percent of the work in content is who sees it if you write the world's best blog post that's seen by your mom and your dog you're not going to make any money with it you got to get it out there and a big part of content marketing that's successful is finding all the right levers to get it in front of the right people often Mm -hmm. Yeah, awesome, believable. Okay, let's talk about uh, finding the right channel. Um, I love, I know, I love reading books, and uh, many books, uh, guides, experts tell that you need to find where your audience is. But you know, I found the trap uh, about that because, uh, for example, if my audience is on Instagram, 
but I don't know anything about Instagram. If I'm so bad to create content for Instagram, for me, it's hard to get results uh, on Instagram. My wife can because, uh, you know, she can spend the whole day on Instagram. I can't. Uh, it's not my loving platform. For me, it's better to spend time on TikTok, you know, to watch these funny videos. I love them. So uh, can you tell how to find the right channel considering uh, your skills? Because for me, it's more important to find uh, platform or social media uh, platform or uh, Google or anything else where you are willing to spend your time. So uh, tell about your ways how to find the right channel. So the right channel is a bit of a tricky question because if you have gone to business school and you are old like me, you remember there's the five P's of marketing. There's product, price, placement, promotion, and uh, person. And promotion here is a variable, right? Out of all of these, it's something you can change. The channel you go to will have a different effect on very similar people. Marshall McLuhan said in the 1950s, the medium is the message. The difference between an Instagram post and a TikTok video doesn't feel like much necessarily as you're consuming one media or the other. But there is a big difference in these two different channels as you think of how they affect people and who tends to use them. So there's two ways to look at how do I find the right channel? One is to say, if I were able to create good content on five different channels, which one would have the best result? The other way is to say, I don't like using this channel. So how do I find the audience that will engage with me on the channel I like to use? And the way you select your approach to content marketing going to be based on who you are are you more flexible in your approach to how you make content are you willing to learn the rules given in a specific medium i do a decent bit of posting on reddit i would not recommend most people use reddit as an acquisition channel because redditors are famously very difficult to work with they're all very particular they have their in-house language they don't like being advertised to it's a whole thing so because I use Reddit and know the platform well enough, I can communicate there and transact and find business. Um, that's a unique skill that some people have and others don't, right? So I can go find my audience there. I'm not super good on TikTok yet. I'm working to get better at it. Uh, so for me, there might be a really good audience there. I'm not finding them right now. The most effective thing you can do as a business owner is not just to look at what is perfect, but what is achievable. So if you had a potential for 100,000 people on Instagram, but you're never going to use Instagram, don't worry about it. How do you build an audience of 20,000 who really care about you on TikTok instead? Mm -hmm. Yeah, awesome. Okay, let's talk about sales funnel. For example, um, I often get uh, content that gets, I don't know, like 100K uh, views a lot of comments likes but i don't sell anything with that and i see when uh, people get uh, traffic on uh, many different channels including seo once i remember one uh, webmaster shared with me how he lost uh, 400 000 traffic a month and he didn't lose any sales so <laughs> this traffic didn't sell products. Can you tell about uh, sales funnel? How to create sure. content that covers sales funnel or buyer journey? So I launched Crowd Tamers as an agency in my own company back in February of 21. And in March of 21, I published a blog post that kind of lays out the philosophy of how to go to market using performance marketing to give you early advanced knowledge of what the market's going to do. And in 2021, I can tie about $340,000 of revenue to that blog post. And you're like, wow, you must have had hundreds of thousands of views. I only had about 15,000 views over the whole year. That was it. Because one, I chose the top of funnel. My distribution tremendously affects the likelihood of someone wanting to talk to me. And the content itself explain things in a manner that made folks want to re-engage with the content more. So first off, I wrote this blog post. The, the week I published it, it got, I don't know, 200 views, nothing important, right? But what I then did was 
I would go into Facebook groups where startup founders would say, I'm not having much luck launching my business. What do I do? And I'd say, hey, here are three bullet points that you might want to consider on how to launch your business. Go read this blog post that answers this in depth. And I was part of maybe four different Facebook groups, combined reach of something like a half a million people. Every day, I would find one or two questions across that half a million people. That was about how do I get my business up off the ground? And I would post the link and I would send traffic to that blog. And because I have a fairly high ticket value, my average client's worth, I don't know, somewhere between ten dollars and $15,000, I was able to, every time I did that, I'd book a call or two, and every three to five calls, I'd close a client. So I just grew the business very, very well by finding people with the exact problem that I had written my content for, distributed this exactly to them. And of course, anybody who opens somebody's Facebook question of, how do I grow my startup? And they see there are 15 responses, 14 of which are, I've DM'd you, I'd like to sell you my services. And one of them is, here's the answer to your problem. You can do it yourself. I believe in you. They're going to go click that link, right? And when they go click that link, then they'll read the blog post. And very frequently, the calls I would have with leads weren't the person who posted the question. It was somebody who looked at the comments of the question, read my response and went, this guy knows what he's about. So you think of your sales funnel, right? And there are broadly three types of content you want to have in your sales funnel. There's top of the funnel discovery content. Frequently, that's social media distribution. If you're a high ticket item, if you're a low ticket item, you can't do it that way. If you're a high ticket item, right? More than a thousand dollars per sale. Somebody asks a question and your answer to their question is the first piece of content that we create in their funnel. And it's really easy for people to think that's not content marketing, right? Crafting a good answer to a question is 100% content marketing because the first thing your content has to do is get folks to go to spend at least two seconds paying attention to you. If they don't spend those two seconds paying attention to you, everything else you've written is garbage anyway because they didn't see it. Yeah. So that when somebody asks a question and you answer it and they go, oh, that's interesting. Let me read the full post now. This guy has some insight. Let me click on the link and read the full 5,000 word post. Right. It's a series of bets. The first bet is, can I get your attention for two seconds? That's can I get your attention for 30. And then can I get your attention for three or four minutes? So if I can make you take that journey. It starts with content, right? It's just plain text on a comment somewhere then a link and then a blog post. If I can make you take that journey, you are really, really likely to take my conversion action afterwards. So think of your funnel. High ticket starts with where do I find people who need my help? I can answer. And how do I make the best possible answer for them? If it's a low ticket item, right? Your e-com, you're selling, I don't know, sneakers. And you're saying, hey, I want people to discover my sneaker store. Then the top of your funnel becomes what are people looking for? And how do I either make answers for them or make it easy for someone to recommend me? Because some of the other content marketing you could do that is the most performative is giving your users content to bring other users to you. Don't just say, hey, share the link out. Write tweets that your users should share for you. This sort of content marketing and iterating on it and experimenting on it is how you end up making high-powered content that builds that sales funnel. So again, think of... The micro copy that gets that first two seconds. Think of the small copy that gets 30 seconds. And then think of what if you do to make them actually engage long enough to take a conversion action. Building that funnel out makes hundreds of thousands of dollars a year with just one channel, right? That was just one blog post only advertised in Facebook comments. And that did 340K uh, 2021. So that tiny and narrow wedge can make a huge difference if you do it right. Nice. Love it. Awesome. Yeah, I agree with that. Uh, okay, let's talk about uh, catching attention. You mentioned that you need to uh, hook attention in the beginning because uh, people, if you write so valuable content, the best content in the world, but if you can't get their attention, people skip it. You know, they will uh, not engage. Uh, and uh, I see today, uh, according to many data, uh, 
for example, people watch 20 seconds of video content uh, on YouTube. Uh, they read uh, only a few sentences uh, on uh, blog post articles because they can't uh, hooked. No, it can't be hooked. So can you tell how to hook them? Because you mentioned about that. I remember once I read a book, uh, Josh Ugerman wrote this book 40 years ago about how to uh, catch attention with short sentences. You need to provide a strong reason to read the entire copy because if you can't, people uh, bounce fast. Uh, and he shared an example with train. For example, if a train can start, it can stop immediately. But if a train has speed, it's hard to stop. You know, it takes yeah. time. And it's the same with uh, users. If they start consuming your content, they can leave it for a few seconds. But if you catch their attention, it's hard to leave it. So um, it's a big chance to, uh, uh, yeah, to consume the whole content. Let me know about hook. How to provide this hook? So the rule of thumb is you have seven to 12 words which is basically what we can scan in about two seconds to convince somebody to pay attention to you and what i like to do i had i did this to great effect back when i was uh head of pr and marketing at gog uh, which is a video game e-com company this was back in about oh four oh that's, that's not right sorry 14 there we go 2014 or so um we had a huge email list Four million people who had bought video games and one of the things we did to make sure we had the right subject line to drive opens was the day before we would send the newsletter we'd buy facebook ads and the facebook ads were four different versions of the subject line for the email newsletter and we'd look to see which one got the most clicks and by seeing what got the clicks then we would know this is the best headline to get interest in our target demographic. And so for the spend of like two grand, maybe on ads, we would improve the performance of an email that went out to 4 million people by sometimes 60, 80%. And when you've got a list that big to 4 million people, 60 to 80% is tens of thousands of dollars in difference in performance. So one of the ways to write a good hook is just write a lot. And this is actually an interesting, uh, when you're in the content marketing space, right now there's tremendous disruption because GPT-3 and GPT-3.5 and chat AI, and all of these things are coming in. People are saying content marketing is dead. You don't need to have a content writer anymore. You just have the AI churn stuff out for you. And there's a, a, a modicum of truth to that in that you can get, about the quality of a high school sophomore, right? So somebody who's like 16 years old, you can get infinite numbers of 16 year old writers for a staggeringly cheap amount of money. If that is enough quality to move the needle for your business, cool. I think what will be generally found to be the case though, is people who produce mediocre content will be able to get better with the help of this tool people who produce really good content mostly use these tools to think up different ways to do their own thing completely that's my use for any of the ai writing tools i will have it write something for me and go that's entirely wrong it needs to be rewritten but at least i had a first draft that i can hate right so when you want to write a hook one you have to get out of your normal box have to think about not what is what not what have I done? You have to think about what is my reader's problem and how do I tell them I'm solving a big problem you have right now. And you can use a tool like ChatGPT to try and have a different mindset than your usual one to answer these problems, but you still will need to rewrite whatever ChatGPT puts out for you. So first, what's my reader's problem and how do I solve it right now? A good example might be the impending recession that all of us keep getting told is going to happen, but hasn't really happened yet. Every business owner is quietly freaking out about what do I do about the recession? If you're able to say somehow what you're doing right now is helping equip them to make better decisions to survive the recession, you'll get their interest. 
And there's tons of other examples, right? During World Cup, as it was running, if you could find a way to brand jack on World Cup, you'd get people who were thinking about to open the link and pay more attention to you, right? You start a hook with what's on people's minds. You start by telling them a story they want to hear. Then two ways you go about this. One is to tell them something that I think is obvious bullshit. And the other is to convince them they're about to lose something. Right? Fear and outrage are good ways to get people to pay enough attention to engage. And sometimes hope and positive emotions too. It's not all doom and gloom. You test, you see. But there's a reason why it's way better to say, hey, don't miss out on your free offer than it is to say, here's a free offer. Come check it out. One of these means you're losing something free. Oh, no. The other is you might get something free and you're like, I'm too busy to deal with this crap. Go away. Right? <laughs> so think of their problem. Tie what you're talking about to their problem right for them. And then think of the outrage. Think of the fear. Think of the pain that you can evoke to make them want to care. Nice. Nice. Love it. Love it. Okay. Let's talk about pain points. Customer pain points. Can you tell more about that? How to learn their pain points? How do I know what kind of problems they have? Any practical tips about that? How to learn customers before creating content? Almost no one who listens to this podcast is actually in the business of selling what they make. And that sounds weird. When you're selling shoes, for example, to go back to sneaker e-commerce, you're not selling shoes. Not really. Not unless you're selling $15 sneakers. You're not selling shoes. You're selling coolness. You're selling belonging. You're selling the feeling of prowess, perhaps. If you're Nike, you sell the aspirations of athleticism and empowerment. If you're Adidas with Yeezys, you're selling, I'm cool. I'm in the in club. I look like a baller because I've got the cash to drop on a 400 pair of sneakers. So imagine what I can do for you, random lady I just met at the bar. That's what you're selling for all that's a piece of leather wrapped around a rubber sole. So whatever you're selling, listener of this podcast, it's not the product you built. It's the result people get out of it. So when you think of pain, we kind of only have three. We want more money. We want to be seen as more important than we are. And we don't want to hurt. If you can find a way to tie to one of those three, you'll begin to find the emotional hooks that pull people and pull, take people and pull them along. So if you're selling productivity software, that's a huge market, right? You're either selling, I'm always on top of all my tasks. Everyone sees how good a manager I am because my team does stuff on time. Or you're selling, quit, get stuck doing boring, busy work you don't want to do. Or quit having uncomfortable talks with your boss on why you didn't do that thing he mentioned last week. Or finally, you have your your projects are in a shambles. Everything's going to go to hell. You're about to get fired. Wouldn't it be nice if you had if you were on top of things to begin with? Either save time, money, look bigger than you are, or don't have pain anymore. One of those three. And someone just there we go. Someone I... was like went by on a real fast motorcycle. <laughs> Yeah, it, yeah, it's close to my speed. <laughs> I get it. Yeah. So like that, that those three pains, find a way to tie your product to those pains. And then you'll be in a better position to evoke emotional reaction. And of course, emotion, one of the three classical hooks, the three that, I mean, Aristotle invented these. I did not, right? Go back 2,500 years. You have emotion, you have logic, which you still frame up in the sense of quit losing money on... I don't know, bad bookkeeping. Oh, no, I don't want to lose money. Or you can say quit losing $6,000 a year on bad bookkeeping. That's a logical argument now with some emotion tossed in too. One of my clients right now, uh, they are uh, testing a carpooling app. And for their average client in their first test market, they're spending $11,000 a year to drive and park in downtown big city. And just to say to somebody, hey, join your neighbors and quit losing $7,000 a year because they have to pay some. $7,000 a year in commuting, very powerful message for two reasons. One, join. I'm part of a group. I'm socially inflating. And two, don't lose the money. Logical argument. And then the third argument you can make is appeal to authority. 
Nowadays, authority doesn't matter so much because we don't trust authority anymore. But appeal to social proof still works quite well. Show me a video. Show me a testimonial. Explain to me how what you did works. I'm more likely to buy. Yeah, nice. Okay, let's talk about uh, pain points more. Um, uh, even more. Uh, for example, when I watch a presentation from Apple, uh, I usually get the feeling to own this stuff. For example, when Tim Cook shared a new Apple Watch, after that, uh, I got the feeling I want to own it. I want to have it. Uh, and I bought three pairs, one for my for me, two pairs for my son and wife because they probably kill me, you know, if I uh, buy only for myself. But, you know, I got the feeling to have to have this Apple Watch because Tim Cook didn't share a lot of features. As you mentioned about logic, he shared three stories how Apple Watch can decide uh, my problems. Today, Atlantic Ocean owns my Apple Watch, but it happened uh, anyway. <laughs> so, but, you know, uh, it's interesting that uh, after getting this feeling, I bought three pairs. Uh, but we have many other watches today, smart watches, good watches. But uh, I uh, am ready to overprice, you know, to pay more for Apple Watch because of uh, getting this feeling that I have it and I own Apple Watch. Can you tell about creating this feeling for customers, uh, you know, uh, when they uh, consume your content and they have the feeling to own the stuff uh, that can decide their problems. Because you mentioned about logic and emotion. I'm interested about that. Your thoughts. So brand, brand positioning, brand persona, all of these things, it's a big part of your content, right? You can't imagine, you can't really imagine Microsoft having an event in the same fashion that Tim Cook does with Apple releases, right? You just, you can't. They, they have positioned to be way more like Apple than they used to. Satya Nadella now does do discussion. They have the big screen. It has much of the same form as an Apple keynote, but it doesn't have the same feeling. And that's because the brand voice, the brand persona of Apple is quite different. So Apple is... I mean, you can go all the way back to the famous 1984 commercial, right, where they throw the sledgehammer into the TV of someone trying to tell you to be a conformist. For all that Apple is arguably, I think, the most valuable brand in the world, they still sell this idea of if you use an Apple, you're an iconoclast, you're different, you're more creative, you're a thinker, you need the extra quality of an Apple product, so you pay more. I've got a smartwatch. Um, and I needed one feature from it, which is I wake up at 5.30 in the morning every morning, and my wife was sick of waking up at 5.30 in the morning every morning. So I needed a wristwatch with a vibrate alarm. Cool. So I paid 40 bucks for mine because I don't need the heart monitor and the there's the uh, satellite signal when you have a car accident in your iPhone. And all like none of those things were things I needed. And I'm more of the fuzzy minded, let me build something on Android, which I can then make it do whatever I want anyway, sort of person. So Apple doesn't speak to me, but to some people it does. And then what you get is you don't want this $40 watch. You want something better than a $40 watch. You want something that speaks to the values of Apple. You want something that shows you a part of this community of people who's the Apple tribe. Right, Social proof and social authority bonds you together. Anytime you see somebody else with an Apple Watch as opposed to a knockoff cheap one, that sends the signal to you. You look him over, hey, he seems pretty cool. I have one of those. I must be pretty cool too. This kind of thing is what you're reinforcing as part of the brand. That's like super high tier, very late business worries about your content marketing. In the short term, what you're looking to do around your brand persona and how your brand voice evolves is for a given group of people, you're solving their problem uniquely well. Apple has carved out a huge mass market niche by telling 750 million people, you are all unique and special and no one is quite like you, which sounds pretty silly when you run the numbers. You all feel like you're part of an inside click in a way that app uh, uh, that Google 
with its 2.7 billion size user base isn't trying to serve right and i and iphone feels like a more special piece of metal and plastic and glass than my android phone does <laughs> because it is they all have this look right can you tell like oh they're seeing the logo can you tell a samsung phone from a huawei phone from a one plus phone from a like no right they're all a little bit different and enough so where you begin to wonder is this like i'm making a jump from one android phone to the next it's not quite the same experience apple experience always remains true that brand voice always remains true and if you're trying to sell at a luxury price what you have to communicate is it's better it's enough better and by owning it you show you're better and then you will pay more for an iWatch than i did for my whatever knockoff brand name this watch is <laughs> yeah i'm glad that okay um let's talk about uh repurposing content for example uh if i create a piece of content but i wanna repurpose to many different formats and many people content creators usually uh try to do it uh but you know i found um, it's a big mistake when you uh, do it for the sake of do it no when for example if i film youtube video and then i'm trying to divide this video for link uh, linkedin post tiktok any other places without engaging with the audience without understanding their pain points it, it's hard to get any result it's the same like to write a blog post that ranks well on google but uh, you use this point to social media posts and can't get anything from that and uh, i tried to cover many social media platforms, uh, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, and got it. Even repurposing content, you can't get results if you don't engage with the audience, if they don't consider their uh, pain points and many different things. So uh, I decided to pay my attention to LinkedIn, where I grew my audience without repurposing content. And I remember Gary Vee started on Twitter as well. He didn't repurpose content when he had a team of content creators who can do it in the right way, he grew everywhere. So tell how to do the right way of repurposing content without uh, doing for the sake of just submitting this content. So every channel has its own unique in language, its own unique shorthand. And what will do well on Twitter, maybe a Twitter thread, right, with a strong first statement a good last statement and then a reminder to retweet the first tweet because that shows up as a collapse collapsed three tweet section with the basically ellipsis in between that piece of content living as twitter native doesn't port well over to linkedin it doesn't port well over to tiktok what you do if you want to repurpose content you can do very well by starting with video because if you start with video you get transcript but then you have to clean them up right it is labor intensive you need to find somebody probably in a cheaper economy than your usual western one who you can say great here's an hour video i shot i want 10 60 second clips out from it i want three blog posts out from it i want five or eight twitter threads out from it and so the ideas you express in the video, just like we've gone through five or six topics already, those ideas can all become the germ of repurposing across all these platforms. But just copying and pasting will rarely deliver you results because uh, life is like a sewer. What you get out of it depends on what you put into it. And content marketing works the same way. If you just copy paste garbage everywhere, well, you've thrown a bunch of garbage into the sewer and garbage is going to come out. If you are carefully making everything look and run properly native to its format, then you'll start to see results in each format. It is extremely labor intensive to do that. So unless you've got a team to back you up, pick one or two channels, optimize to deliver on those consistently, and then let the rest fall to the wayside for now. Social media distribution is critical to the success of your business that is going to be true but you also can't be all things to all people you have to find a channel or two where you're seeing performance and really go hell for leather there um 
in the middle of October, I decided to start doing LinkedIn more than Twitter because Twitter wasn't de deriving me much value. And so I posted every single day on LinkedIn for we're up in the 75, 83, somewhere in their days now. And that starts more conversations. That channel grows faster. That I'm finding is a much better distribution network for my type of content than Twitter is. So I don't, I post maybe once or twice a week now on Twitter, right? Just enough to see my Twitter friends and talk to them. And now I'm testing out TikTok because the only better distro algorithm I know of than LinkedIn is TikTok. So I'm seeing, can I produce content that speaks to people there? Can I make that content work? But TikTok content is going to be very different than LinkedIn content. And I found, because I'm like, I've made these TikTok videos. I might as well post them to LinkedIn and see how they do. And the answer is not super well. My text posts do quite well for engagement and comments. My video posts, everyone's just like, next. That's not for me, right? So you'd think, what's a vertical video on your phone? It's the same either way, right? Audiences react differently. Yeah. Uh, you remind me of a content creator, uh, and she got uh, more than 2 million followers on TikTok. But uh, on other platforms, she can't get uh, the same amount, even 100k followers, because uh, uh, he told me TikTok is only one place where you can create content without promotion, without engagement with others. So on LinkedIn, we need to promote. On many other platforms, we need to promote. Of course, if you have audience, if you have a big loyal audience, probably you don't need it because your audience can promote your content. But on TikTok, with zero followers, you can achieve high results because it's platform created for content creators without any marketing and uh, something like this. So yeah, uh, I have the question about common mistakes. Can you list common mistakes that marketers still do? uh in uh, content marketing and how to find a much better way today so one of the like the common mistake the number one mistake is i made content i didn't distribute it it didn't make me money content mm -hmm. marketing sucks like that's the the usual one two three sequence or I posted an article to LinkedIn once a month for, sorry, once a week for two months. I didn't get any numbers. LinkedIn sucks. I quit. <laughs> right. Of people who post content regularly on LinkedIn, which is only like 2% of the audience, 90% of them post once a week or less. Of the 10% who post more often than once a week, Something like 95% have tried posting daily for less than 30 days and then given up. If all you do is pick one channel and post daily for 45 days, you will have been more disciplined about your distribution than 99.9% .9 of any of the users on any channel. So the first mistake people make is they make their content and they don't promote it. The second mistake people make is they publish their content, but they try it in a haphazard fashion and then give up too soon. The third big content marketing mistake I see is the content marketers don't own the performance. If you are fortunate to be in an organization where there are many people in the marketing team and the content marketing team is its own little wing of the people in their turtleneck shirts with their Starbucks espressos and their hipster beanies on their head, and they're just writers, right? There's, I wrote the content. I just, I wrote the content. What's your problem? I wrote the content. When you look at professional content organizations, by which I mean journalists and news outlets, those journalists are responsible for both the word count and performance. If you don't hit your traffic numbers on your posts, then you will be fired. But in most businesses, if you hit your word count, you can limp along for six months or nine months, and then eventually they shut the whole content marketing team down because content marketing doesn't work. A good content marketer is way more than just a writer, and she or he creates the content, looks to see what works, 
analyzes search traffic, analyzes performance on blog posts, analyzes engagement on all the social channels and goes, oh, these are the topics that people care about. Let me do more of this. Let me find new ways to say this. I've been doing content on Crowd Tamer's blog for two, or well, actually for 12 years, uh, but not regularly, regularly for two. Uh, I've been creating content on LinkedIn at least once a month for three or four years on Twitter for the last two. I only have five things I say. I only have five topics, I should say. It's not the exact same words every time. And every single piece of content I make speaks to one of those five piece themes that run through my content. And it starts to sound as you're coming up with, yes, what's yet another way I could talk about landing page conversion improvement? You start to feel like, people are going to get bored of me. Nobody pays attention to you. That's just generally true in life, but especially true in internet marketing. If you say the same thing constantly for five years, people might start to remember, don't you talk some about that? Because they've all got their own lives, man. They've got their own crap going on. If they see you every day, every day in their feed of, Startup marketing, startup marketing, startup marketing, startup marketing, in my case, or I don't know, um, best way to, to run your PR agency. It's a PR agency over and over and over again. Yeah, in a couple of years, it'll sink through their heads eventually. Oh, yeah. I remember what that dude does. That dude writes about PR. I, if I Oh, I know somebody who needs PR work. Let me refer them over. Like I had a, a, a lead come in. I think they'll close as a client who... Uh, their husband was in the marketing team of a different company that I pitched and lost the pitch on two years ago. And when she needed, oh my goodness, a train now. And when she needed somebody to do marketing and she mentioned to her husband, I need a marketer. He went, I know just the guy to do go-to-market tests because he followed me on LinkedIn and sees my stuff constantly. So I was still in his head two years later. And as far as like, content marketing funnels go, the classic one isn't lose a pitch to a company, be in someone's LinkedIn feed for two years and then close his wife on a deal. But it's a good example of the serendipity that content marketing and continually reinforcing your message brings, which is no one can predict that funnel. No one sets out to build that funnel. But if you're there in people's faces all the time with the right message at the right time, you vastly increase the likelihood that you'll be remembered when you need to be. Love it. Yeah, I could agree more with that. I remember Mr. Beast posted videos uh, for an year and a half to get 1,000 subscribers. He didn't give up. He uh, kept doing what he loves. So they, I don't know the number it's like 35 million to, more it's crazy oh, yeah. Oh, yeah a lot PewDiePie posted 100 videos to get only uh, 285 subscribers yep. today he has 110 million subscribers uh these guys didn't give up because of uh because of results so they love what they do. So it's patience. If you love what you do, you can go ahead uh, and uh, results will come. Yeah, I agree with that 100%. You need to have patience if you want to get results. Uh, and you're learning your skill, right? When I was in yeah. college, I was in a photography class. And the photography teacher said, look, I don't care what you do. There's two different groups in my class you can bucket yourself into. One is... You only have to turn in five photos at the end of the year. That's it. The whole rest of the year, I don't care. The other group is you must turn in 30 photos a week. And out of those photos, we will choose five for your end of year show. Mm -hmm. Most of the kids went, I'm going to go into the, the bucket of only five photos. And they would they would be, in, this is, I'm old. They were in the dark room, right? Printing actual photo negatives. And they would they would be there maybe once, twice a month. Right. They took a few photos, they're artsy, you know, art liberal major types off. They went. And then there were the people who were workers who did the job and who got better at photographers because they made they shot two or three or five rolls of film every week. And at the end of the year, all of the best photos, all of the A grades came from the kids who were there putting in the reps. 
So when you don't have any subscribers, when no one's listening, you're still learning your trade. And if you do this daily, do this as frequently as you can, you'll not just be learning your trade of making a video, you'll be learning your trade of getting it in front of the people who want to see it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, it helps to create confidence and it helps to uh, improve your quality, you know, because I don't know how to create quality without quantity, you know, so you need to, to film a hundred bad videos to get uh, first results. So it's the same for PewDiePie, for Mr. Beast, for anyone else. Yeah, yeah. Agree with that. Tero, I have the final question. Uh, let's yes. imagine uh, you have no skills, knowledge, uh, you didn't create 14 companies, you didn't earn 20 million dollars, uh, you started from scratch. But you have the goal to create 14 companies, you know, to earn uh, crazy money. What will you do today to learn more about content marketing? To learn, I mean, the, uh, the best way to learn is really to do, right? Like I'm starting TikTok content marketing. I'm speaking purely B2B to startups. And what I'm trying to do is figure out what's the right type of content to make. Because I've seen a bunch of other people startup marketing expert advice. And I think it's all pretty bad. And so that made me go, well, rather than watch it and go, oh, look at these clowns. Why don't you put on your grown up pants and go make good content? So, OK, right now, I'd argue I'm probably making bad content. I'm learning. And the only way to get good at it is to do it. The constant repetition of effort over time is a pretty good definition of work. And there's a reason why people pay for work because the thing you have to do is wake up and go do a thing that maybe you don't necessarily like to do. Maybe you're not sure anybody will like, but if you do it enough times, you begin to gain the skill to be faster at it, to have more confidence at it, to know what to do when X goes wrong or Y goes wrong or when you want to achieve a or b result and as you've acquired all of those skills that's what takes you from an auteur or a, a writer or somebody who would like to maybe be big on the internet but you know it's it's too late anyway all the big ideas have been had and say no man i'm going to stake out my ground i'm going to go do something enough times to find my niche and then go win Nice. Yeah, uh, I agree. Bad content doesn't exist. You know, if you create this content, if you spend efforts, uh, that's good content. Even if you ca can help just one person, it's enough. Even if you can help yourself <laughs> and anybody else, because it's like training skills. I love it. So it's a big pleasure to get in my show, to learn from you, tell our audience how they can reach out to you, learn more about you, follow you. So you can find me on Twitter at Trevor Longino. You can find me on LinkedIn at linkedin.com forward slash in Trevor Longino. You can find my agency at crowdtamers.com. My blog there is full of several hundred articles about launching startups and figuring out how to validate and go to market. Uh, I have a book called Validate First, which you can find on Gumroad and on my website. And uh, I mean, you know, anybody who's uh, looking at building a business, figuring out how to tackle the big questions around what makes the business unique and special, go check out my website. Maybe it'll help. Nice. Guys, you can find all these links in the description below. Listen to us on Apple, Google, Spotify. Thanks again for your time. A big pleasure. I'm going to read your book because I love reading books. I see you share a lot of valuable insights. So it's valuable. I recommend 100% to anybody to read this book, to open website, to uh, reach out to Trevor because you can see a lot of value. Okay, guys, love you. See you.